thanks to those of you who have joined. I'm sure more people will be trickling in here as we go. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, we are the Colorado Renewable Energy Society, and we aspire to support a 100% renewable Colorado through education, engagement, and connection to networking opportunities across all Denver communities. We are a statewide nonpartisan nonprofit 501c3 membership organization that has five chapters throughout the state of Colorado. And tonight, uh, what you can expect is a few announcements from the chapter, and then we will transition things over for our feature presentation. Um, this is going to be a very interactive presentation, so we will be asking that if you do have any questions or comments, either feel free to use the raise hand function or type your question in the chat. We'd like to hear from you directly tonight, so I will be calling on those who submit questions or have their hand raised, um, so be ready to just unmute yourself so we can all talk directly. If you want to learn more about CREST, please feel free to do so. You can become a member and learn more about our organization at our website, www.cres-energy.org. And if you'd like to share your feedback, we know we haven't actually seen any of you in person for quite some time now. It's a year, um, actually, since our last in-person event. It's hard to believe, but we do still want to hear from you. We still want to keep the conversation going. Please feel free to email us with your thoughts feedback, any speaker ideas at mdcres at cres-energy.org. And if you'd like to continue to support us in other ways, we always appreciate that. Um, you can donate to support us online at our website, and you can also Venmo us at mdcres. And if you're ordering a lot of packages online, um, you can choose CRES to be your charity of choice on Amazon Smile. Um, and then a portion of the proceeds will go towards supporting our group. It is also the 25th anniversary of CRES this year, which is incredibly exciting. We're working on planning something exciting when hopefully we can be together in person later this year. But in the meantime, we wanted to do a little something to give thanks back to all of you who have enabled us to survive for these 25 years. So we are offering 25% off your annual membership to encourage you to make the transition to Flipcause, which is our new membership platform. Um, when you go to our website to renew your membership, you can just use the code CRES25 at checkout and that should automatically apply for you. And with that, I will turn it over to Johnny. Thanks so much, Lindsay. Hey everyone, I'm Johnny Rogers. I am the policy liaison for the CRES State Board and with the Metro Denver chapter. A few updates for everyone this month. So at the State House, we are back in session. There have been a number of clean energy bills. Three I want to highlight for folks. First, SB 21-072, Modernize Electric Transmission Infrastructure. The legislature is calling for RT uh, regulated utilities to join regional transmission organizations by the end of the decade and also helps to fast track uh, new transmission infrastructure that can help connect renewables to the grid. Interestingly, uh, former PUC commissioner Francis Concilia put out a opinion piece in Colorado politics that is definitely worth a read. Uh, she considers this bill to be one of the largest transfers of power from the towns and communities in Colorado and the Colorado PUC to an authority that is accountable to no one. Um, she has a lot of concerns that I think are worth looking into and tend to be in opposition to the perspectives that I've traditionally held and others in the environmental community and those looking to promote more connection of uh, renewables into the electric system. But fascinating stuff that made me think and kind of uh, question, you know, what is the right approach for how we build out our electric system and how and when we should be connecting uh, on a more regional basis. The second bill, uh, SB 21-161, Voluntary Reduce GHG Natural Gas Utilities, worded very strangely. Don't ask me how legislators come up with their name. And there's also nothing voluntary about this. It actually requires the PUC to adopt rules that would establish greenhouse gas reduction programs for both large and small natural gas utilities. 
by 2025, requiring a 5% reduction in GHG emissions, 10% by 2030, and 15% by 2035. It's good to see them paying attention to this sector, but it's also a little confusing considering that the targets that were set in House Bill 19-1261 for economy-wide greenhouse gas reductions actually call for a 50% reduction in GHG emissions across the entire state, all parts of the economy by 2030, and a 90% reduction by 2050. So perhaps they're thinking that, you know, natural gas utilities have kind of been left out of the calculus for how we're going to meet those targets, and this will at least ensure that something is happening while we focus on transportation and the electric sector. So curious, but we'll see where it goes. And the last one, I'm not sure if it was introduced today or not, but uh, it should be dropping very soon. They build a modernized gas utility demand side management standards, doing things like counting methane costs in gas planning, enabling fuel switching from gas to electric options, and encouraging energy efficiency measures such as weatherization or solar thermal to reduce gas use. So really would be a big, big step forward in updating the gas demand side management programs, which been lagging behind. A number of other bills that we're waiting on that we'll give updates on in April, and I won't uh, talk too much about them now. Lindsay, you can go to the next slide. We've got two regulatory slides here. The first, Excel Energy at the end of this month is planning to release their clean energy plan, requesting almost six gigawatts of new renewables and uh, leading to the retirement of coal plants, which account for 40% of the system now, driving that down to 4% in 2030. We're going to see if we can get that number down to zero, uh, but really, really exciting steps forward and looking forward to getting into the details of what that plan uh, really lays out and making sure that it keeps costs you know, affordable for customers, builds a reliable system, and eliminates carbon as quickly as possible. And as part of that is a transmission power pathway, almost $2 billion worth of investment uh, connecting different parts of eastern, southern, and uh, a big loop around Colorado, effectively, that will be helpful in connecting new renewables to the system. So that'll be probably a years-long process, um, really evaluating that proposed set of investments, determining whether or not it, they are prudent and how necessary they are to meeting our uh, clean energy goals. Very, very exciting. Uh, next slide. Uh, three Public Utilities Commission proceedings of note. Uh, first, Excel Energy's phase two raise making. So phase one is how much money do they need to power, uh, provide the electric system and keep it reliable and you know, operating. Phase two, how are those costs shared between customers? Uh, residential customers in this proposal would actually see a majority of the costs shifted onto them, resulting in a 6 or 7% increase in residential electric bills. Uh, we're working to try to uh, minimize that impact and ensure that the customer class cost of service study has been done properly to ensure that residents, uh, residential customers aren't being overly burdened, and looking to introduce things like time of use rates that can uh, encourage commercial customers to adopt things like solar or storage or grid flexibility into the way they operate their facilities and provide them with opportunities to save money on their bills while providing valuable services back to the grid. Uh, I'll skip over the other two in the interest of time, but we want to make sure that community solar, solar bill credits um, stay up and are appropriately valued for the service they provide back to the system um, and continue to promote a robust community solar market in Colorado and that plans are, are written in this new rulemaking to govern the distribution system, account for things like non-wireless alternatives, providing you know, batteries and uh, solar and other resources that can help us to avoid the need to build out more substations and physical infrastructure that uh, will just add costs to um, building and then maintaining the system. And then my last slide, and I'm excited to uh, turn it over to the real presentation. So in local news, Denver has released its net zero energy new buildings and homes implementation plan, striving to have net zero energy new construction by 2030. This definition means that all buildings will be highly energy efficient, all electric, powered by renewable energy, and providers of demand flexibility for the grid. 
It's really exciting stuff in this 2021 uh, code adoption cycle will help take some meaningful steps forward for the first set of properties that we're trying to drive into those four categories. And then there's a phased approach every three years. Uh, there'll be more and more building types and sizes that uh, will be expected to comply with these with these targets. And secondly, Denver was approved to build nine community solar projects by Excel Energy. These projects will share power between city facilities and low-income housing. We're hoping to start construction by the end of 2021 and complete mid-2022. They're also looking at Excel's next application cycle to hopefully identify more opportunities for community solar projects that can be distributed in socioeconomically and geographically uh, differentiated parts of the Denver community. And with that, I am very excited to turn things back over to Lindsay and Stephen. Thank you so much, Johnny. Lots of very exciting stuff going on. I've got several questions here we could dive into, but we'll have to save it for our next policy update. So thank you so much. Um, speaking of when our next policy update will be, it will be on April 15th, just before our next presentation next month. So in April, we will be hearing from Will Manns about the energy impacts of the cannabis industry. So he's a program manager from the Colorado Energy Office that's been going through a pilot uh, to really understand how to best manage the significant amounts of energy use required by the cannabis, the growing cannabis industry here in our state. So very much looking forward to that. And without further ado, I'm even more looking forward to hearing from Stephen tonight. We will be learning all about how to simulate climate change solutions using the En-ROADS model. And with that, Stephen, I will go ahead and turn things over to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, yeah, so today I'll be telling you about the Enros Climate Simulator, which is a <clears throat> freely available online tool um, that allows you to uh, create different scenarios for future climate uh, policies and um, uh, societal changes and whatnot, and then see how that affects the see how that affects the climate system, the expected warming, uh, et cetera. And so this was a a model that was developed by Climate Interactive, which is a nonprofit environmental think tank in, in collaboration with the MIT Sloan School of Management. So just a brief agenda of what I'll be talking about. Um, first, I'll give a brief introduction. Um, then given this, this is uh, Chris, I'll talk about where how renewables fit into all of this and sort of some encouraging news uh, uh, related to renewables. And then we'll just jump in and play around with the simulator and I'll show you the website and we'll, we'll play around with it for about 30 to 45 minutes. Um, and then uh, hopefully we'll <clears throat> learn quite a bit and, and uh, get really uh, stoked to go out and, uh, and uh, implement some of these uh, changes that we've learned about. And then at the very end, we'll have a, a little debrief where we'll talk about what we've learned uh, and sort of uh, you know, possibly strategize for some future uh, actions. Okay, so first a bit about me. Um, so by day, I'm a physicist. I'm a research scientist at Honeywell. Um, I've been in Colorado for about 10 years. I got my PhD from CU Boulder about four years ago, I guess five years ago now. Um, and, uh, you know, as a scientist, I kind of like had heard like climate scientists talking about the urgency of the climate crisis for quite a while, but, you know, just didn't really see any action and sort of like came to the conclusion that like, you know, government really has to step up and do something. Um, so as a combination of that, as you can tell from these photos, I also love getting in the outdoors and doing stuff and like, you know, <clears throat> enjoying the wonderful mountains we have in Colorado. Um, and other places as well. Um, and so it was a combination of these two things that sort of prompted me to to, volunteer, to get involved. Uh, so I've been involved with Citizens Climate Lobby, uh, which is a nonpartisan group that's uh, advocating for a uh, revenue neutral carbon price uh, for about three and a half years. And then about a year or so ago, I started training to become a climate ambassador for En-ROADS and I recently uh, got certified as a climate ambassador, uh, which just says that I've like gone through the training to facilitate presentations such as these. Um, so as, as we, uh, as you may know, uh, so this is like the a screenshot of the main uh, page that you'll see when you open the En-ROADS app. And so it's a cutting edge simulation model that we use to test climate solutions and generate scenarios for the future. And we'll get into it 
in much greater detail in a few minutes. Um, but first, I just want to highlight some of the features of En-ROADS. Um, so on the right side, you kind of have a, a two-dimensional plot where the horizontal axis is like sort of like speed and simplicity. So the right side is like faster, easier to use, more transparent. The left side is like more complicated, slower. And basically, the idea is that En-ROADS sort of complements these much more complicated models that are you know, much more detailed, but, uh, but a bit slower. Um, another thing to note about En-ROADS is that it's a global model, so it deals with uh, like uh, changes at the global level. Um, and there's another thing called C-ROADS that allows you to look at this for particular regions. Um, it's transparent that all the underlying equations are available, so they have about a 400-page document on their website where you can like look up all the equations that underlie all of the different uh, uh, knobs that you can turn in the model. Uh, and also the assumptions are adjustable as well. So if like you think that like some of their assumptions are just wrong, you can go in and change a lot of them. Um, and if we have time, we can kind of dig into that a little bit. Um, yeah, so it's meant to complement, not uh, take the place of these more uh, detailed integrated assessment models. Um, and one thing to point out is that it's not really meant to predict the future, but rather it's meant to support discussions, to learn and to strategize and to sort of uh, plan for the future based on real data and science. I think the main philosophy of En-ROADS is, this is hard for me as a scientist to, uh, to read this, but uh, is that, uh, so John Sturman, one of the founders of Planet Interactive and a professor at MIT said that showing, research shows that showing people research doesn't work. And this is, you know, a basis, a basic idea in human psychology that it's like very difficult to change people's minds about things um, if you just present them with like a bunch of facts. And so instead, it's better to actually give somebody a tool and let them sort of learn for themselves um, how, to, how to think for themselves, make their own decisions, kind of their own conclusions. Um, so Buckminster Fuller, a famous architect, said, if you want to teach people a new way of thinking, don't bother trying to teach them. Uh, instead, give them the, a tool, the use of which will lead to new ways of thinking. And I think it's precisely this philosophy that um, kind of underlies the, uh, the end row simulator. And so that's why our session today, I'm going to try to make it as interactive as possible given the group size that we have. Um, because I'd like you to, uh, I, I don't just want to lecture at you, I want to actually like facilitate a discussion um, with all of you. Uh, so I probably don't need to go over this too much, but I, I thought I'd briefly review the science and what's at stake um, so that we know what we're up against. Um, so as you probably know, atmospheric CO2 is higher than at any time in the last roughly a million years, and the rate at which it's increasing today is sort of unprecedented, like over the past million years. Um, and of course, this is because we're pumping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, predominantly CO2 and methane. So as you probably, as you might know, methane is actually, has a much higher warming potential than CO2. Um, and so it turns out that like, that will also be an important like ingredient to getting uh, the climate system back on track is to reduce methane emissions as well. Um, I like to think of uh, this analogy of thinking of the atmosphere as a bathtub, where the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere is basically the, uh, you can think of it as the water level in a bathtub. And then the CO2 that we're pouring into the atmosphere is basically like the, the faucet is open, water is pouring, gushing in. Um, you know, eventually the, the bathtub will overflow, but, you know, there's like a small hole at the bottom that's letting some water out. You know, like trees and the soil absorb some CO2. Um, but by and large, like the level in the bathtub is, is rising on Earth today. And we'd like to get it to the point where uh, that, level of, that level of water levels out or even starts to decrease. So we need to like create more holes in the bathtub to be able to, to get more water out. Um, but you might say like, well, you know, I've heard a lot about like things becoming more energy efficient. Like, isn't that gonna help? Isn't that, wouldn't that, wouldn't that just solve all of our problems? Um, well, it turns out that's not, <clears throat> not so true. And um, so this is a graph that you can see within En-ROADS, but I think this sort of illustrates kind of the predicament that we're in, which is, um, so these are called Kaya graphs. And basically the idea is this was developed by a Japanese economist, Yochi Kaya. And the basic idea is that the, the total energy CO2 emissions is equal to the product of four factors. So it's equal to the global population, which is projected to increase over the next century, times the GDP per capita, which is also predicted to increase quite a bit over the next century times the energy intensity of GDP, which is basically like, uh, you know, how much energy we're going to use per trillion dollars of GDP, times the carbon intensity of final energy, which is like how much CO2 is being released into the atmosphere per unit of energy. 
Um, and of course, those last two plots are going down over time as we as we make energy more efficient. However, the product of the four is still going way up over time just because the global population and GDP are growing much faster than we're making energy more efficient today. Um, so this says that like we need to do some other things besides just like make things uh, more efficient. So the baseline scenario according to En-ROADS um, is they expect 3.6 or 6.5 degree, 3.6 Celsius or 6.5 degrees Fahrenheit of warming by the end of the century. Um, and most scientists agree that to avoid the worst effects of climate change, we need to get, we need to keep that to more like 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius. Um, so just to give you an idea of like what the world will look like at different levels of warming, um, I kind of like this chart here. So this sort of shows how different uh, aspects of the world um, will be affected by climate change on a color scale where uh, white or yellow would be like, you know, some change that we can probably deal with and purple is like, very high risk of like irreversible damage. I mean, as you can see at five degrees Celsius of warming, uh, most things would be irreversibly affected. Um, however, the one to two degrees Celsius range, like uh, that's sort of the range in which like we can learn to adapt to that most likely. Um, so this really kind of highlights the importance of keeping the warming to 1.5 to two degrees Celsius. You've probably seen pictures like this where like, you know, this is New York City today and with the projected sea level rise, in the next century, this will uh, this is what New York City might look like uh, at the end of the century, um, and of course, our other coastal cities will share similar fates. Um, and of course, climate change is just very expensive. So between 2016 and 2018, climate-related disasters cost about 650 billion dollars. Um, even by the time we reach 1.5 degrees C, it's expected to cost over 50 trillion dollars. And I think by the end of the century, a lot of economists predict that like climate related things will cost a few trillion dollars or like a sizable fraction of GDP per year. Um, so it really behooves us to kind of solve this problem now. Uh, you know, people are like, oh, dealing with climate change is expensive, but, but the, um, the consequences of climate change are also very expensive. And of course, there, are, there have been many examples of consequences close to home, such as the floods in Boulder in 2013, the wildfires this summer, um, now it's, you know you can't attribute any particular event to uh, climate change, but just sort of the overall frequency of these, um, you know, hundred-year events is is going up over time, and I think that's a correlation that uh, definitely is is quite sound. So how do renewables fit into this? So one thing I should mention is like thinking back to that slide that I showed you of the baseline scenario in Enroads. Um, if you opened up Enroads last year, actually the expected temperature change would have been 4.1 degrees Celsius, um, and now it's 3.6. And the, the main contributor to that reduction of half a degree is basically the, uh, they sort of reevaluated re the role of renewables and, and, and found that they actually are like growing significantly faster than they thought initially. And so like um, basically that this increased demand for renewables and sort of phasing out of fossil fuels is predicted to sort of, um, you know, give us that, Point, extra 0.5 degrees, um, but as you'll see when we open up the simulator, we need we'll need more than that. Um, and yeah, just these are a few slides from this Renewables 2020 Global Status Report, which you may be familiar with. Um, so in 2018, about 80% of energy came from fossil fuels, um, but about 70% of the new investment was in our renewables, which is very encouraging. And I really like this chart here. So this chart basically shows the cheapest energy generation technology by country. And in just five years, from 2014 to 2019, a whole handful of countries, including the U.S., um, renewables became the, the cheapest technology. So, like in the U.S. right now, like wind is the cheapest source of uh, ener of energy generation. And I think this is like incredibly promising, saying that like uh, you know fossil fuels should just like be on their way out uh, anyway. Of course, the problem is that like you know the infrastructure takes a long time to to change. So that's like part of the problem. Um, and then, of course, there's also a positive feedback loop of renewables where, um, you know, once you produce a lot of renewables, um, you gain experience in producing them, uh, and then uh, they actually get cheaper. And so basically every doubling of, of installed capacity of renewables reduces the price by about 20%. So this is incorporated in the En-ROADS model, and this is something that you can actually, like, fiddle with if you, if you think that 20% is not quite right. Um, but this is in contrast to, like, fossil fuels, which basically this progress ratio is basically zero. 
So fossil fuels don't really get cheaper as you increase their capacity. So you know this will just make renewables cheaper and cheaper over time, um, and hopefully more and more prevalent. Um, and of course, subsidies will only help help this. And you can think of it. So this is like probably very apt from the snowstorm we had last weekend. But you can think of it as sort of just like you know the prevalence of renewables is like basically the growing size of the snowball as it rolls down the hill as it picks up snow as it rolls down the hill. Um, okay, so with that, I will. <laughs> actually jump over to the NROS climate simulator. Um, I assume you can still see my screen. Yep, we can. Okay. All right, great. So um, so there's a lot going on here. And um, so basically on the bottom panel here, you have all of these, you have 18 different sliders. So these sliders basically allow you to change various parameters. So for example, on the left side here, you have energy supply. So these are like, sources of energy and basically if you move a slider to the left it puts a tax on that particular thing and if you move it to the to the right it puts a subsidy on that thing um, there's also a carbon price uh, which is one of my favorite policies we can get into that a little bit later um, the other cool thing is like any of these things if you don't know what they are you want further clarification you can click on these three uh, dots here so for example you might wonder well what's new zero carbon what is that so if you click on the dots it brings up this little box here which has like more detailed settings as well that you can change. But new zero carbon would be something like nuclear fusion or like um, thorium-based nuclear fission, like some energy source that doesn't exist right now that's like, you know, in people's minds or that like is being currently researched and developed. Um, so that's <coughs> so that's the, the left part here. The middle part here, there's um, energy efficiency and electrification in both the uh, transport sector and in buildings and, and industry. And so if you uh, go to the right, it would basically mean like more efficient or more electrification. If you go to the left, it would mean less um, for growth. Um, the status quo population that they assume is is uh, 11, about 11 billion people in 2100, but you can you know adjust that if you think there'll be more or less people. Similarly, like you can look at GDP, um, you know, how much they have a, a modest estimate of how much GDP will increase per year. Um, and if you think back to those first graphs that I showed, that's a contributor because more GDP means more energy demand. Um, and then on the right side here are sort of uh, other emissions and, and sort of removals. So like this land and industry emissions, so you can, so there's a separate tab for deforestation and afforestation. So for the deforestation, moving this to the left would mean less deforestation for afforestation, moving this to the right would mean that you plant a bunch of trees. Um, and uh, and then the technological carbon removal is things like uh, soil car like regenerative agriculture, biochar, um, minerals like capturing CO2 in minerals, uh, capturing it direct air capture, a direct air capture of CO2. Um, and then there's another tab for methane, which is basically just kind of lumps a lot of things into one category, but sort of generally reduces methane. Um, and so then the cool thing, the other cool, a couple of other cool features are about this are, for example, um, if you, uh, so for example, like, you know, the carbon price is one of my favorite things. If you just like jack the carbon price way up, you see the temperature, expected temperature increase went from 3.6 down to 2.7. This left plot up here basically shows as a function of time, the global sources of primary energy. And so, um, you know, coal is brown, oil is red, renewables are green. Um, so the total height of this thing is sort of the total energy demand. So like right now, it's basically 600 exajoules per year for the entire planet. By the end of the century, I think it was predicted to be like 1,200. If you enact this uh, very high carbon price, it would be maybe more like 1,000. Um, but the cool thing is you can replay changes. So like if you want to see how, like when you change any of the knobs, if you want to see what it did several times to really kind of key in on what's happening, um, then you can replay the last change. And then also notice how like the uh, the, the other plots will have like a baseline uh, in black, which is sort of like the business as usual default scenario. And then the current scenario will be the blue curve. So that will also like show how the different parameters are affected by changes that you make. So if I replay that last change, um, you'll see it uh, go several times. Um, 
Okay, my computer is being very slow right now, so uh, you might have to use your imagination there a little bit. But um, and the other, the other cool thing is like when you change one of these, uh, when you change any of these parameters, like actually under the hood, like fourteen thousand equations are basically being like recalculated, and and with the time, so it's basically showing the entire century from like you know two thousand twenty one hundred with a time step of forty five days. Um, so you know it's putting like you know, basically about a thousand, like thousands of points on this on this plot here. Um, so anyway, that was quite a bit to take in. So I think now I might just kind of open it up to the audience to um, kind of get your opinion on like, you know, uh, given what I've said and like kind of the options that are available to us here, like what are some things that like you personally think have like uh, would be like a, you know, a huge like uh, potentially a silver bullet to solve the climate crisis or like would be a good thing to do. Um, so maybe let's uh, take like, uh, I don't know if we want to do that um, by just allowing people yeah. to sort of like opening up the chat or. Yep, I'm gonna go ahead. I have one question that I'd like to ask and then Tim and William, I'm gonna go ahead and open up your mic so that you can ask your questions after. So, so my question is actually going back to the Kaya graph. So, it looks like the CO2 emissions from energy were increasing over time. And I was just a little bit confused about what is playing into that increase there. Yes, yeah, so I think it's basically it's basically just the product of these four things. So if you look at the units, uh, oh, so okay. One, okay. if you look at the units, this is like basically like, you know, number of people times dollars per person per year. So this is so when you multiply these two together, that's basically dollars. Then you multiply that by this energy intensity, that gives you total amount of energy. And then you multiply that by this one, that gives you megatons of CO2. Um, yep. And then the result is gigatons per year. So the thing is that the, especially oh. the left two plots are increasing much faster than the right two plots are decreasing. Got it. Okay. I wasn't sure if that was supposed to be a separate one or or the culmination of them. So thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, so really and the equation now, is like yeah, so really the equation is like this picture times this picture times this picture mm -hmm. this picture equals the picture on the right. Perfect. Okay, that makes sense. Great. Thank you so much. And with that, I will turn it over. I am going to unmute you, Tim, so you can go ahead and ask your question. Hopefully this works. <laughs> Hello, yes, two questions, hopefully yep. pretty quick. Uh, earlier you you mentioned uh, the cost of climate disasters. Uh, was that US or global? Uh, that's a good question. I know the $2 trillion I think is like just for the US. Um, so sounds like it, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think uh, that was just for the US. And, and the other, the the slider bars at the bottom of this page, is there any way to see units or relative percent or something like on those? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, again, that's where these advanced settings come into play. So for example, like carbon price. Um, so like if I just jack up the carbon price to uh, very high, you might wonder, well, what does that mean? Um, so if you click on the three buttons here, this actually shows the carbon price in dollars per ton of CO2 over time. Um, and you can really model this like however you want. So you can basically set like some initial carbon price, how long, when it starts to phase in, how long it'll take to reach its initial price. And then if you wanted to ramp it up again to some final value, you can do that. Um, so for example, like, you know, I, I work with uh, Citizens Climate Lobby. And so like their um, proposal is basically $15 per ton, um, basically right now. It would be $15 per ton in one year. Um, the final carbon, it was then increased by $10 per ton per year. So we have like 80 years till the end of the century. So we'll call that 800. Um, we'll say that uh, that starts phasing in in 2022. And then we'll say that it takes like 80 years to reach the final um, price. And so now I basically, Put in a carbon price that's like linearly sort of increasing throughout the century, reaching like $800 a ton at the end of the century. Um, similarly, like you know, for the for example, um, in afforestation, um, 
So they make some assumption about how much land in the world is available for afforestation. So I think they assume it's something like, I don't know, 700 million hectares or something, which is like maybe like three quarters of the area of the United States. That's like roughly the area of forest that's been like chopped down since like the industrial times or sort of since pre-industrial times. Um, but like, you know, you can basically, you know, crank that up to like whatever fraction of available land you'd like. Um, and then you see how much, and then here this plot here shows you like, so when you also, when you open these advanced um, sliders, it opens up sort of auxiliary graphs, which are sort of relevant to that particular parameter. Like here, it sort of shows like, uh, you know, how much CO2 you would be removing from planting trees per year. So like if you planted 95% of the available trees, you'd basically be removing about five gigatons of CO2 per year by the end of the century. Now, one thing that's kind of interesting here with afforestation, this shows kind of the dynamics of like this is that like you see like you know here the start year is set to be 2021, so it's like okay we go out and plant a bunch of trees right now, but the problem is like you know trees take a long time to grow, and so you don't actually really see it take off until like 2060, 2080, or something like that, which is like you know a bit too late. Um, so that's like so you know some people will say like oh we just need to go plant a trillion trees or something like that and it's like well yeah that's great but like you know if we had planted them like 50 years ago that would be great um yeah. uh does that answer your question the, uh almost maybe just a slight follow on are all these bars arithmetic or geometric or exponential or kind of a blend depending on their situation uh, i think most of them are are linear so like when you change the slider like if you change it like say here versus here i think that's like twice okay thank you um, but again you can always open up the advanced settings and like see exactly how yeah. you're doing yeah yeah great great thank you tim and then just quickly before we open the mic up to william he's asked a great question um how can we access the model so for people who want to follow along and play around at home what is the quickest url to type in um, so, I mean, it's really just this URL right here. Uh, so, the other, the other really cool thing about this is that, like, so you'll notice that when I change any of these uh, sliders, that the URL at the top of my web page changes. So, you can actually, like, literally, like, copy this URL, send it to somebody else. And, like, I actually, like, send my, I actually, like, had made these simulations, made these things on my other computer. I had just emailed myself. Um, an email with the URLs for the different scenarios that I had created. Um, but the base, the base one is just this https://enros.climateinteractive.org. Great, thank you. If you just move the Enros Climate Simulator, uh, I can show you how to bring it up. So, yeah, this will be it. And then you just say, um, close out this prompt here, and there you, there you're good to go. That's great. Hopefully that helps everybody who wants to play along. And then William, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you if you'd like to ask your questions directly. Maybe not, we still still can't hear you. So I'll go ahead to and ask the questions that you typed in here. Um, so the first has already been addressed. It was what is the horizontal scale of each slider? So you just click on the little three bars to the right and then you can open that up and then the second is why is the energy scale expressed in terms of exajoules instead of watt hours by the way can you hear me now oh yeah yeah go ahead okay yeah uh, you you demonstrated pretty well the the horizontal scale it wasn't clear how the scale and i think tim asked had the same question um you know is it like in percentages or whatever but we got that squared away um and you told me about accessing the model so the only question that i have left is why um does the um, um energy graphs um have the vertical axis and units of exajoules why not watt hours which is something we're more familiar with uh, yeah, I think that's a good question. I mean, I think you can definitely convert between exajoules and kilowatt hours or um, whatever. I think it would end up being like probably like, uh, you know, like 10 to the, I mean, I, I forget exa is like 10 to the 18, I think. So, I mean, it's like, it would be a lot, of, it's a lot of watt hours, you know, it'd be like 10 to the 18 or something like that, I feel like. So, 
I think just to keep the numbers on a manageable on a manageable scale, they just write it like that. I, I understand why you're using exa as a prefix, like mega or kilo or whatever, but I don't understand why the unit of measure was chosen to be joules instead of watt hours. Well, I mean, a joule is a, I mean, uh, energy is like, is power times time, right? So power is expressed in watts, and then time is like the hour. So the kilowatt hour is, is basically equivalent to uh, energy, which is expressed in the SI system is expressed in joules. Huh. All right. Okay. Well, does that make sense? So I, I always thought kilowatt. Actually, so as a physicist, I think kilowatt hour is actually a very weird unit because, like, like watt is a derived quantity, whereas like joule is like a more fundamental quantity, in my opinion. But uh, but yes, I, I sympathize with like you know in the industry. Um, yeah, people generally talk about like kilowatt hours and stuff like that. Um, Something that we're more familiar with. Uh, I can certainly suggest that. I can certainly suggest that to them. I mean, I don't make the website. I just present it, but I can certainly suggest that to them. That they, uh, yeah, have that as an option. All right. That's that's all. Thank you. Yep. Great. Thanks so much. All right. And then, um, Becky, I will go ahead and unmute you next. Hi, Stephen. Um, I'm wondering what the difference is between N roads and C roads, another climate interactive platform. Yes, I think I mentioned this at the beginning. So N roads is the global model, whereas C roads is like the more specific model for like a particular region, like North America or Europe or um, whatever. So. Um, oh, thank you. Thank the basic you. underlying I thing. The, the basic underlying uh, system is the same. Great. Thank you very much. I had to join late. <laughs> Great. And then, Greg, I will go ahead and turn it over to you. I think you can unmute and ask your question. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Stephen. Um, I was uh, maybe did cover this, but I'm wondering as you quote solve climate change, or at least attempt to solve climate change by adjusting the levers. Um, you know, you can see the effects on the climate on that graph above, whether things warm up or, or maybe not warm up so much if you arrive at a better solution. But is there anywhere an analysis of what things might cost? I mean, you've got graphs talking about economic growth and things like this, but in terms of dollars, what various solutions will cost? I mean, we know that climate change is going to cost us something um, if we do nothing. Um, but like maybe, I don't know, nuclear costs something, a uh, carbon price, depending on what kind of a schema we use, what might cost us something. Um, but like or, uh, building technology, for example, you know, sequestering carbon or pulling it back out of the atmosphere. Oh, here we go. Yeah. What is so it? There, Can you think about so what it costs? Like, so there is a financial section here. So, uh, the, so one thing to note is that the, uh, so the plot that, the default plot that's shown here is like one of like maybe a hundred different plots that you can show. So this is like a list of all the different categories of plots that you can show on the right side. And then each of them has like plots that you can show. So for example, like there is a financial section, but it mostly deals with like cost of energy. And that's a very good question, but it doesn't really talk about like how much it's going to cost to, you know, subsidize renewables or how much it's going to cost to like, if we develop nuclear fusion to like, proliferate that or like how much it would cost to like uh, uh, do direct air capture or something like that. So that is like one thing that's perhaps like missing from the model. Um, there is one interesting thing on here. It's like uh, the reduction in GDP from climate, sorry, the reduction in GDP from versus temperature. And so these are just like different, econo different economists like predicting like what their reduction in GDP would be. Um, versus uh, temperature change from 1850. And I think going back to what I said earlier, um, you know, I think it's gonna cost a lot of money to solve climate change, but I think it's potentially gonna cost way more if we don't. Um, and unfortunately, I don't really have a better answer for that um, uh, at the moment. Thank you. 
Great. Thanks, Greg. And I, oh, sorry, was someone trying to say something? Oh, I was just going to say, I, I see that we're running a little low on time. I mean, did you want me to go until 8 or a little past 8? Or, um, I mean, we already had some questions. I guess I did kind of want to dig into the, some of the dynamics that you can see in the model and then sort of show a scenario where we like won, so to speak, and then kind of show yeah. some of the things that I was like talking about earlier, like the bathtub type thing. And like, there's a plot on here that sort of illustrates the bathtub and like, um, to show some of the dynamics that happens. Perfect. Let's let's hold on more questions for now and let's let's have you dive dive further in. Thank you. Yeah. Um so so uh anyway, I think we'll we'll sort of see throughout this that basically like there's no one knob on here that you can change that will completely reduce this warming to the level that we're targeting like 1.5 uh, to 2 degrees Celsius. Um so for example like so what actually happens, like, for example, let's just say that I wanted to, like, put a, I think coal is bad, and I just want to really tax coal. So let's say that I put a very high tax on coal. Now, if I replay that last change, um, you'll see what happens is, like, the, uh, you know, actually, what like, the gas and oil will compensate a little bit. Um, and so, like, the problem is, like, you know, if you only tax one particular source of fuel, then sort of the others will compensate. Similarly, if you put a huge um, subsidy on renewables, if you replay that last change, note that the total energy demand by the end of the century, according to the model, actually decreases, actually increases. So the fossil fuels, which is like the brown plus red plus uh, blue, certainly decreases. The green increases because we've subsidized renewables. However, because we've subsidized renewables, we've sort of like put in a new form of very cheap energy. And when something is cheap, people want it. And so then there's more demand for it. And so then the total demand for electricity goes up. And so as a result, like subsidizing renewables in and of itself, only more than it already is, only is predicted to give you a 0.1 degree Celsius uh, difference in temperature. Um, similarly, the new zero carbon, if you were to implement that, that would have, that also doesn't have a huge effect because like, well, for one thing, like it doesn't exist yet. So it would take a long time to commercialize or another thing, like it would just compete with everything else that's already everything else in the energy landscape. Um, so if I reset my assumptions now, um, another thing that people talk about a lot is like, oh, if we just like electrify all of our cars, that will like electrify all of our cars and buildings, that will like solve all of our problems. And like again, that's not a huge a huge win, just because like so if you actually replay that last change when you electrify things. Um, you actually see that uh, that coal goes up. Uh, it's, it's hard to tell, but I think definitely for the for the transport sector, like if you just um, yeah, if you electrify the transport sector, coal, you'll notice that the brown goes up a little bit, and that's because like you know if you plug your electric car into the grid, which is still powered by coal, then like it's going to actually like increase um, demand for coal. Um, Another, similarly, you can model, so I think I have here, uh, which one is it? Yeah, so this one, this scenario here is basically modeling, like if everyone in the world became vegetarian. Um, so it would basically be like, um, you know, putting in a moderate amount of deforestation. So like reducing deforestation um, and then like moderately reducing methane emissions because we would have like less animals and stuff like, like less livestock. Um, and you can see that like, yeah, the non-CO2 greenhouse gas emissions would this turnaround and start to decrease towards the end of the century. But, you know, this is only going to affect at like the 0.2 degrees Celsius level or so, um, or as, as predicted by the model. Um, oh, and I guess this would also increase energy efficiency a tiny bit. Um, so, you know, a lot of the things that people say are going to be like huge things to solve the climate crisis. I mean, they certainly help. They don't hurt for sure. But, you know, it's, it's going to take more than just that um, to solve the issue. So, Maybe just kind of showing like what it would um, take. So I think I've already kind of alluded to the fact that like you know taxing individual fossil fuels is not the most effective thing. The carbon price I feel really strongly about because it just sort of like sends a market signal to all fossil fuels uh, that all fossil fuels are going to become more expensive. Um, so that's I think that's the single biggest uh, win you're going to get in this model is the carbon price. Um, and then, of course, energy efficiency helps quite a bit. Um, 
less deforestation, more afforestation, some technological carbon removal, and reducing methane. You'll see that that, that does get us to the one point below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, so the main conclusion that you come to when you do that is like, if you look at like by the end of the century, like sort of like the the total amount of fossil fuels is like very small. And you can actually, um, I think, look at that. Uh, yeah, so in, in this scenario that I've just created, like basically by the end of the century, about 90% of, of electricity would be coming from renewables. Um, and then the and then the interesting thing to look at is CO2 emissions. And then if you actually look at um, cumulative, uh, sorry, not cumulative CO2 emissions. Um, uh, so if you look at the CO2 emissions and removal, so this is going back to what I talked about with the bathtub, where like you know we're we're pumping so much CO2 into the atmosphere, we're removing some of it. Um, and so in this scenario, basically around 2030, we would start, so the red is showing the CO2 emissions over time, the blue is showing the CO2 removals, and this is from a combination of natural CO2 removal from like trees that are already existing and like the soil and stuff like that. Um, so if I were to like turn off the afforestation and turn off the technological, um, and put deforestation back, you see that like um, the CO2 removals go way down. Um, but you can see that like sort of around uh, 2030 or so, sort of the removals outweigh the emissions. And so at that point, you would expect the CO2 concentration to actually start going down. And when you actually look at CO2 concentration, indeed, you see that it starts going down around 2030. That's sort of the point at which you're, you're removing more than you're putting in. Um, and so then the other interesting thing about, so I think maybe a cleaner way to see the, some of the more interesting dynamics is like going back to this uh, case with just the carbon price. Um, if you look at greenhouse gas net emissions and look at sort of like, you know, remember the carbon price was sort of starting like this year and then sort of increasing rapidly until the end of the century. If you look at the greenhouse gas net emissions, basically like that starts to decrease almost immediately like sort of businesses and everything gets a little bit more expensive. People realize they need to cut back on, green, on things that have a high carbon footprint and they just adjust, uh, the economy just accordingly. Um, and, and then so the greenhouse gas emissions like start to fall pretty rapidly. But then if you look at, um, again, at this CO2 concentration, um, that's delayed by quite a bit. So that only starts to deviate from the baseline around like 2030, 2040, 2035, something like that. So that's sort of showing that like the climate system has these like kind of intrinsic like um, lags built into it where like, you know, you can change something today, but it might not show up until like um, 10 or 20 years from now. And then if you look at um, temperature change, again, that doesn't really start to deviate from the baseline until about um, 2035 or so. And then the other interesting thing is if you look at sea level rise, for example, like the sea level rise is predicted to be about 1.2 meters by the end of the century. And with this like pretty significant reduction in temperature, that only goes down to about one meter. So it, you know, maybe it went down by like uh, six inches or something like this. Um, but that doesn't actually start to deviate from the baseline until about 2060, 2070. So the sea level rise uh, is like even farther delayed in time from these other changes. And I, I think this also says that like, you know, if this, if you, you know, if you trust in this model that, um, you know, we sort of already have, like even in the best case scenario, like in this case where I got to 1.3 degrees Celsius by the end of the century, if you look at sea level rise, in that case, it's still a good fraction of a meter. So it's still basically like three feet by the end of the century. And so to, to sort of say that like coastal cities like Miami are going to be like saved if we stop emitting CO2 like today is, is a bit uh, disingenuous. Um, but yeah, so uh, there's like a bunch of other things um, that you can play around with. I guess I, I mentioned that you can adjust um, the assumptions as well. So there's this assumptions tab. If you click on simulation and go to assumptions, there's also a bunch of different assumptions that you can change as well. So for example, like, um, you know, if you think that like, so like for example, and then like also all of these have descriptions as well. So for example, climate sensitivity is like, you know, if you double the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, how much the temperature will increase and stuff like this. 
Um, so if you think that that's like higher than three degrees Celsius, you can like, you know, crank this up and like, um, and so, uh, yeah, there, there's a whole treasure trove here of like stuff that it's, it's kind of a playground. You can, you can get lost in this and play around with it for quite a while. And, um, but I think it's awesome that like such a quantitative tool exists for like everybody for like, you know, uh, like, uh, for lay people to just play around with. I think it's super awesome. Um, and, uh, and they keep, they keep making changes all the time. They keep improving it all the time. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's probably from like, yeah, I can pass on the suggestions that you gave here. Um, and, um, uh, but, uh, yeah, so I think now would be a good time to um, kind of go back to the slides. Um, I have a few final slides, and then we can just open it up for discussion and questions. Um, okay, so uh, I hope I was able to convince you that um, you know it takes more. There's many ways to save this. There's no silver bullet. It takes more than one seed to plant a garden, um, but no single policy is enough to solve the climate crisis. It takes a whole entire suite of policies. Um, but I hope I showed you that like, it is possible. It's gonna take like a, an extraordinary amount of work um, on a whole bunch of fronts, but it is still physically and technologically possible to um, limit the warming to a level that like we can deal with. Um, but uh, <clears throat> I would challenge you to find a scenario where you end up with less than 1.5 degrees by 2100 that doesn't like keep most fossil fuels in the ground by the end of the century. So in other words, like those, uh, the coal, oil and natural gas uh, sliver of that energy demand should basically be pretty much zero by the end of the century. Um, oh, sorry. Um, okay, so now I think it's a good, it's good to uh, take a, a moment of reflection. Um, so, um, this would be a good thing, I think, to just if you can in your chat box, like uh, if you can think of something that you would love about, you know, if we were able to to achieve all of this and actually be part of this world where we can limit warming to like a, a, an acceptable level. Um, so if, if you're so inclined to uh, write something like that or um, other questions that I'd be curious to know about um, are like, you know, what and what I've told you surprised you? Did you have any like key insights and uh, what will you take away? from uh, this presentation today. So maybe let's just uh, pause for a moment and um, let people enter in uh, some responses. And then maybe just in the interest of time, maybe uh, Lindsay, if you can just read some of them. Sure, sounds good. All right, so I think the common theme here is that, you know, group needs to see this, right? So um, I think it's wonderful that you're sharing it with us and that we can share with our communities. But I know as a part of CCL, I believe you guys have been actively working to share this with other groups. Have many politicians, to your knowledge, been exposed to this? Has this tried to inform different legislation around carbon pricing, for example? Um, so I don't know if anybody's used it explicitly to advocate for carbon pricing, although I'm, I would try to use, I think in the future, I might try to do that. Um, but in terms of like exposing it to politicians in general, um, yes, it definitely has. Unfortunately, I don't have my extra slides on, on this guy to change computers at the last moment, but um, yeah, there are a bunch of quotes from politicians who have like played around with this and say, this is like the most awesome thing ever. Like, um, so I, I think it'd be really great. Like, and I, you know, when I talked about this with some CCL people, they were like, "Oh, we def like in our next lobby meeting with uh, our congressperson, we need to like take this to them and show it to them." Because, um, like, I, I think this is just like, a great tool. Um, and uh, yeah, I think like uh, like any like um, anybody in energy policy would just geek out on this like for for days on end. I feel like so. Um, Yes, it is being it is being exposed to politicians. I think politicians are aware of it. Um, some politicians are aware of it, not all of them. But I think like getting the word out about it to our elected officials, I think um, I think is a good thing. Uh, but um, yeah, I think just like yeah. finding time to like finding the time to be able to explain it to them, I think would be like the main challenge. I would say. Um, yeah, that's interesting. 
Um, makes sense. Another kind of key insight from several people is just how important the interaction of the quote unquote solutions is that we truly do need to all work together to make it happen. There's lots of repeating the fact that there's no silver bullet. Um, and um, I think that was that was really interesting for a lot of people. Um, and then another comment here, the factors have a significantly different level of impact on the environment, you know, than the environmental factors do on CO2 and global warming. So that was a surprising insight. You know, what we think are the big, big ticket items may not be. So that was, that was interesting. Um, surprised at the use of um, coal in the role here. Uh, lots of comments saying that you've done a very impressive effort here. Um, so here's a good question for you. When we interact with the model, what's the best case temperature in the year uh, 2100 that we should be aiming for? So have, what's the best temperature that you've you've come up with in your efforts? And is there a known best temperature that we could reach? Um, yeah, I think something like, uh, I mean, we. I guess I don't usually crank all of these up to 11 just because, like, you know, that's maybe a bit unrealistic. But I think if you, uh, I think 1.2 or 1.3, I think is the best I've seen. Um, okay. The other, the other interesting thing to look at is that the, in, like, in the case where you do achieve, say, 1.2 degrees Celsius, like, the temperature actually does go above 1.5, but then it starts to actually go down. Um, so I think like basically this is like a common thing that you'll see with any of these uh, scenarios that um, do actually like get below our target is that like it, uh, it you know, it again, this is like another lag in the climate system. It takes a, the temperature change takes a while to respond to the CO2. Con like, um, I mean, it, it closely follows CO2 concentration in terms of like the time dynamics. Um, but, you know, that just takes a long time to respond to like immediate changes in like greenhouse gas concentration yeah but i don't think i've ever seen a scenario on here where it like never goes above 1.5 and then it always usually goes above 1.5 and then starts to decrease after that yep that makes sense thanks for sharing that um so lots of you know some sadness here uh saying that i didn't know it was too late to prevent sea level rise um so some realizations a lot of a lot of people have questions around the cost given the level of change. And I think for me, it was a good takeaway and a good reminder as somebody who works in this space that yes, it is costly, but it's more costly. In Inaction is more costly. So I think that would be an interesting area to further explore just more insight into, into the cost. But yeah, just a lot of notes of appreciation coming through and I will I will echo those as we wrap up here. Thank you so much for your time, Stephen, and for walking us through all of this. I know I am very excited to continue to dive in and play around and share with um, my colleagues and peers in the sustainability sector. And I hope that all of our members in attendance tonight will do the same. So big, big thank you for, for your time. And um, we hope that you continue to go out and share this with more people and continue to spread your impact. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, that's actually a really interesting point about the uh, about the costs. Um, and, I mean, Greg, Greg brought this up as well. And uh, yeah, so I, I'm a very, as you can probably tell, I'm a very quantitative person. Um, so I would be actually very interested in like quantifying that a little bit better. And um, yeah, it kind of bothers me sometimes when people say like, oh, this is going to be like way worse than that. But it's like, okay, but like how much worse? Like I want a number. Um, right. So, <laughs> I would be very interested to see it. I think yeah, I might actually I might actually send an email to Enros and ask them if they can add some additional because they added this. They they didn't used to have this thing about the that that plot that I showed that was like the reduction in GDP versus temperature rise. They didn't used to have that. They only put that in recently. And so I feel like oh, they okay. could they could do a similar thing with like I don't know cumulative cost of not dealing with climate change versus uh, or just like break it up into like, I don't know, like just like climate related disasters and like, I don't know, infrastructure loss or something like that. Um, 
So then that could, that could be another interesting plot that they could add on. Um, um, but yes, I'm happy to I'm happy to stay on for uh, you know a little bit longer and take build any more questions if people have questions. I kind of rushed through the some of the um, some of the things at the end there. I guess before we we uh, break and then let people stay on if they're interested um, in asking further questions, I just have like two more slides. Um, so here's just a few final thoughts. Um, so yeah, so I've shown that basically like you know we have all of the tools that we need. Um, to solve this problem. Uh, I think there should be a lot of encouragement and that renewables are getting so much cheaper and growing so fast. Um, and I know I put solar panels, I got solar panels put on my house recently. Um, so I feel really good about that. But like, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's like, you know, it's kind of a drop in the bucket, but uh, you know, every little bit counts. Um, and, uh, you know, the other thing I would say is like, um, don't underestimate the power of like just kind of like reaching out to your colleagues. So yeah, I think like sharing this with your colleagues. And I think um, one of the best things you can do, I think in the climate fight, I would, I would argue is almost like equally effective as like say getting solar panels put on your house would be so like if you like go out and like, you know, tell everybody you know, like that you care about climate change and like tell them why they should care about it and like tell your elected officials why they, why you care about it. Um, I feel like that's almost like some in some sense like stronger than like just like um, you know recycling more or like driving an electric car or something like that. Um, so I think like um, that's something that I've kind of like come to appreciate more as I've like gotten more involved in these um, these environmental groups. Is like uh, you know a lot of it is is just about like educating and engaging the public and sort of building public support for these things. Um, and, uh, and then one final plug, I guess, for the uh, so the, for this training series that I uh, completed. So if you're um, so if you're interested in uh, becoming a climate ambassador and learning how to like facilitate these discussions, um, there's like uh, you basically have to do like a, an online training um, and then give a few practice presentations, get feedback, take an online quiz. Um, I think in total it was probably like 10 to 12 hours of my time or something like that, but I don't know. I, I it didn't really feel like work to me. I, I enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, and uh, yeah, and then I have like you know I have like a few other. I think like um, so now that I'm officially recognized as a climate ambassador, I'm like featured. I'm like listed on their website, um, and so like people can like reach out to me if they're interested in having um, future talks. And if, if any of you are interested or know of a group that you think would uh, benefit from hearing about this, I'd be happy to give a similar presentation to any other groups that you know about. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm just excited to like, uh, you know, spread the word about this and like give more of these presentations and uh, kind of reach a, a, uh, a bigger audience. Um, I feel like mostly I've talked to like people from CCL about this and like CCL people are like, you know, super friendly and like, you don't really get any hard questions from CCL people because like everybody's on board with like everything you're saying. But like it, it would be really interesting to like uh, I kind of want to you know give this presentation to more like um, you know neutral audiences where there you know might be like you know a variety of like people come to a, with a variety of experiences and just kind of like um, you know see how see how effective I I can be at like um, you know teaching them something in that in that situation. Um, uh, so with that, I think that's all I have. Um, thanks again for uh, for coming, for, um, for listening. Thanks for all the great questions, and I'll be happy to take more if you have any. Oh, great. Thank you. Yeah, um, there's a bunch of people. Jamie has about three in the chat box here. Awesome. It's a really nice tool. Very cool. Um, I wonder if there's any uh, use for showing a margin of error in these um, projections. Would be my first question. Yeah, so I think I asked them that question uh, before as well. Like, what are the error bars on any of these things? And I, I just say I kind of forget what they um, kind of forget like what they <laughs> what they said. But yeah, I agree that would be very useful to have a uh, like an error bar on like say this temperature number or like. Um, I think the like some of these plots, I think the the numbers are like pretty accurate. Like for example, this one, the global sources of primary energy, I would say that one would be like you know pretty small error bar. Um, 
Mm -hmm. But you know, I, I guess like all of, you know, they compare their model against all of these uh, fancier, like more sophisticated models, and they sort of, um, you know, they generally do a pretty good job of agreeing with those models. And I think like if you look at some of their other slides, which I don't have up on this computer at the moment, like they have, um, they sort of show some of those comparisons. Um, uh, that reminds me of a um, something I heard the other day. There are no accurate mo models. There are only useful models. Um, but anyway, my next question was, um, is, is is somewhere in there and maybe in the um, under impacts, does it show potential implications or could it of what global temperature change could result in on the output side? So that could be kind of speculative, but things like species extinction, population migration, changes in agricultural production, increased extreme weather, uh, and weather ramifications like drought, floods, uh, fires, uh, tornadoes. Um, not, not yeah, not really. Um, I mean, I think they have like I think sea level rise and ocean acidification are the two things that they have as impacts that they can um, that they can quantify here. Um, but um, yeah, I would imagine they're probably going to be trying to add stuff like that in the future. Um, so I think this, along with this issue that other people brought up about. Um, you know, just like getting some quantifying the cost of, of not dealing with climate change, um, you know, maybe like, uh, uh, but yeah, unfortunately, I don't think there's anything on here that any plots on here that like directly show like, um, you know, like how, how much di more difficult it would be to like grow, grow crops and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's a tough problem to try and model, but it would be interesting to show a result that directly touched people. Yeah, I totally agree. Anyway, Great. thank you very thanks. much. Yeah, thanks, Jamie. And then um, going off of Jamie's question, John and William both asked this. I know you just sort of addressed it a little bit with the error bars, but we're just curious about the how the model is validated and how trustworthy is it. So if you could just go into a little bit more detail on that, that'd be great. Um, yeah, so they basically like uh, they constantly like refine their um, predictions against these like more complicated integration integrated uh, assessment models. Um, but yeah, so I mean, um, I guess I can pull up some some plots here. But basically, they they compare it against a whole suite of these integrated assessment models and um, and sort of like see pretty good agreement and then like sort of validate. Um, you know, models about a bunch of different things like temperature increase, CO2 concentration, um, also just like the expected like growth of coal over time, the expected growth of other fossil fuels um, over time. Um, uh, um, yeah, sorry, is there interest for seeing more like more detail plots or like uh, do you, uh, is, that, is that a satisfactory? Is that sort of satisfying? Uh, I think that's probably satisfactory, and then I'll let people chime into the chat if it's not. Um, but I think one last question here that would be great to answer is from Richard. Okay, I wanted to ask the question is, I'm a little bit concerned about um, <clears throat> the base curve that you show in black. I assume that that's um, sort of picked out of a, a set of black curves, but I don't know for sure. Um, I'm, I'm, and I'm also a little bit disappointed in that we should talk more about what's going to happen by 2040 or 2050. This going out to the end of, end of the century is, is wonderful, but it doesn't, it doesn't connect to people because most of us aren't going to get to the end of the century, even if you were born yesterday. Um, <clears throat> other than that, I'm primarily concerned about the ice melting in the Arctic. In, um, the Antarctic. It's moved, melting very fast and it's got more effect on temperature than we see, seem to realize. Uh, yeah, so going, okay, so maybe to address your first point about the uh, end of the century, I mean, yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, you know, I'm not, <clears throat> um, you know, I doubt I'll make it to the end of the century. I'd be like 110 something, like over 110 by that point. So, you know, I probably won't make it to the end of the century. Um, 
but I mean, I guess the, I guess the thing is like um, you know, like for example, like if you look at the, I think it is important though to go out that far because like if you look at you know the case this case where we've implemented a very high carbon price you know like we don't really see i mean even in the case where you where you see a huge temperature reduction by the end of the century you don't really see anything i mean at 2050 you see you definitely see a difference between the baseline and and the uh the current scenario that i've shown here but like you know for a modest temperature uh decrease like you really hardly see any effect at all by 2050. So I, I agree, like um, there should be more weight put on like say mid-century than, than 2050. And perhaps there are other metrics such as like, you know, agricultural uh, yields and, um, you know, droughts and wildfires, like if you somehow quantify that, that would maybe resonate with people a little bit more. But I think it's, yeah, unfortunately, I think it's just kind of like the dynamic, the timescales that are relevant to the climate system are just like inherently like very long and so like you know the century is really the kind of time scale that like um you know it is, is actually relevant um now going back to your initial question about like the uh i assume you meant like the uh this like temperature change curve like you know trusting whether the black line is actually like correct or not um so again, I mean, they compared it with sort of most of these, like the IPCC and IEA and all these other um, models, and sort of that was the one that like you know fit it um, the best. Um, but again, you know, you can go into the uh, if you wanted to play around with a different, sorry, if you wanted to play around with a different, um, like if you thought that the baseline was higher, then you can go into this assumption for climate system sensitivity and say make the climate sensitivity much higher so that means that the temperature increases more for a doubling of co2 than than like what the model would predict um, so for example like i just cranked this up from three to 4.8 degrees celsius and now the expected temperature increases five degrees celsius and so now um you know now if we try to play our game of uh you know doing everything we can um it's you know it's going to be a lot harder uh, as you might expect. Uh, uh, and so there, yeah, so, you know, with that assumption, like I was barely able to get, doing all the same things I did before, I was barely able to get to two degrees Celsius. Um, so, um, yeah, if you're interested in learning more, I highly recommend, like, yeah, looking at the resources on their website, they go into a lot more detail about this, like a lot more detail than I can go into right now. Um, but they do have documentation on their website that sort of backs up all of the, all of the assumptions of their models and like how they validated it against all of these more sophisticated climate models. Oh, okay. And then was there was there another question or did I address all of your questions? Um, you you addressed them to a, a fair extent. Um, yeah, we still have really a, a ways to go, but I I really think we have to start finding some curves that are going to turn this thing around faster than um, what's what's there because more things are going on. The the amount of um, um, methane is going up faster than expected and, and things like that. And, you know, there's, there's just so much going on that we really have to work hard to get this curve to start turning around. I've been following it for 30 years and I actually knew about it back in um, 18, uh, 1970s from limits of growth. But, um, it's it's that good so far. Thank you. Yeah. So okay. Sorry. Sorry. So just to address one final point that you kind of reminded me of. So um, yeah, you talked a bit about like uh, methane and like um, so like but yeah, you can also and the assumptions are basically like you can change. Um, there's this one here: the effect of temperature on methane emissions from permafrost and path rates, which is basically like if you think that. Um, so I think if you increase this, yeah. So if you if you increase this, this basically will like you know make the permafrost melt faster and release more methane. And yeah, that that causes a huge change. That that, that basically like you know just added a degree Celsius onto like what I thought was two degrees Celsius. Yes. Um, in terms of uh, the sea ice sea ice melting, I think I have to look again at like how they modeled the sea level rise. Um, but 
yes, I think if a huge chunk of Antarctica like broke off uh, before the end of the century and it all melted, I mean, Antarctica has like, I think like at least 100 or 200 feet of like potential sea level rise, like in all of the, if all of the ice in, in Antarctica melted, it would be like, you know, like 200 feet or something like that, um, which is obviously a lot more than what, which, what I was showing here. Um, but um, I guess I, I don't, I have to, I have to go back and look and run, remind myself of like how much uh, sea ice from Antarctica they expect goes into that projection. Um, I was thinking more of the, the Arctic in, in the case that we're losing the uh, reflectivity of the ice and we're now absorbing more heat into the, um, the weather system because we're losing all the ice at the, on the Arctic. Yeah, I think mean, I mean that effect is, uh, yes, I, I, know, I know the effect you're talking about. It's like the, it's called like albedo. Uh, I, think, I think that's like, uh, I think that's included in this model. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for all the great questions. I know that we're, we'll, we're still seeing a few more come in, but I also am sensitive to the time. So I think we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap things up here. But I think to Richard's point, you know, I, I'd love to see stuff happen faster. And I think that's why just sharing this and making sure we're all taking immediate action collectively as a group um, is going to be the next step for all of us, you know, just to, to continue to work together as Colorado Renewable Energy Society and joining up with groups like CCL and continuing to share these types of things is going to be a critical next step. So thanks to you all for your attention and thank you again, Stephen. Very much appreciate your time and your um, answering all of our questions and providing such an engaging and interactive session for us tonight. That was great. I enjoyed it a lot. And yeah, thanks for all the great questions. I think I have some homework to do now. So, uh, but I think that's good. I think it's always good to have like questions that I don't really know the answers to. Um, so, so thanks for all the, thanks for some thought provoking and tough questions. Yeah, absolutely. And there's one, uh, one of our contacts from, um, who's been a long time CRES member is asking if it's okay if I share with her your contact information. Do you mind if I connect the two of you offline? Oh, uh, yeah, that's fine. Okay, great. Well, thank you again all. Um, have a wonderful night, and we'll hopefully see you back here in April. Thank you.